A uh, number of years ago, when Julie and I were still in college, a group of our friends decided to go camping on Susha Island one weekend. And those of you who know, know the San Juans, Susha is a small island in the north part of the San Juan Islands, and it's only accessible by private boat. There's no ferry that goes there. And since we were poor college students, we did not have access to an appropriate vessel, uh, appropriate boat. But we thought our friend Mike, uh, his parents' ski boat would get us there. And so it's a small little ski boat that's meant for lakes and pulling people on, a, on a water skis. And on Friday night, it was great. The water was calm. We got across the channel, and it was a beautiful weekend. That is until about midway through Saturday night, and we were sleeping in tents on uh, the peninsula of this, <laughs> of this island, and this huge storm blew in. Our tents were like permanently at a 45 degree angle, just blowing, almost touching our faces. And we woke up this morning with a real conundrum because we didn't have enough food for another day. Two of us had to work that afternoon. We thought, well, let's just go for it. We didn't know any better. Well, we got about halfway across the channel, heading towards Lummi, uh, the Lummi port, and we were terrified. We just started, like, legitimately fearing for our lives. We were in these huge waves and this boat that was not designed for this type of, of conditions. <laughs> Well, obviously we made it back, thankfully, but it was not without deep fears, the, the scariest experience I've had on the water. And when we recounted the story to a relative of ours who spends a lot of time in the Salish Sea around the islands, we were admonished for our foolishness. And we realized just how close we came to a real uh, crisis in that moment. Our decision got us caught in a stormy situation, and uh, that is kind of the reality of what happens in our story today. The reality is that poor and foolish decisions can sometimes lead us into adverse conditions. And this is where we pick the story up in Jonah. And so uh, Jonah has made a deliberate choice a decision to flee from the Lord. And last week we noticed that whereas God called him to arise, go up, to be a missionary to his despised enemies, the Ninevites, he instead goes down, down to Joppa, down onto a boat, down below the deck of a boat. There's something being communicated here. He is on a downward trajectory, and we discover today that his choices start to catch up with him. And as he is on the ship bound for Tarshish, we read in our text that a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Now, what we, we notice in this scene is that the choices we sometimes make to go against the grain of what God is calling us to, if, if we ignore the voice of God, we can find ourselves bumping into some stormy conditions. There are consequences when we make this choice to go in the opposite direction of what God calls us to. Now, we need to be careful here because not all storms that we face in life are the result of our choices or our sin. Uh, one writer, I think, summarizes it well, that the Bible does not say that every difficulty is the result of sin, but it does teach us that every sin will bring you into difficulty, right? Not every difficulty we face is the result of our choices. The sailors are caught in a storm, and it's the, they're impacted by the choices of somebody else, right? In the book of Job, he faces all kinds of adverse conditions, and everybody thinks it's because he's done something wrong, and the point of that book is that that is not the case. Sometimes we are just caught up in a world gone wrong, and, and it's outside of our control, Right? So not every difficulty is the result of our choices, but when we do intentionally walk away from the Lord, we can expect to face some stormy, adverse conditions. Now, this has been foreshadowed for us. We were expecting this. A close reader of the Hebrew narrative here would expect this to be the case. Last week, we noticed the emphasis of the, the type of ship that Jonah boarded. He boards a ship for Tarshish. And what we discovered last week is that ships sailing from Tarshish show up all the, uh, throughout the Bible, and they become a symbol of idolatry and luxury and pagan influence. 
And so if you do a quick Bible search, you realize that uh, the ships coming from Tarshish often came with gold and exotic goods. That's how Solomon got all his gold and all his, all his things from ships sailing from Tarshish. And, and throughout the Bible, sometimes God brings down judgment on these ships as a symbol of the danger of what this town represents. And so we've already had this foreshadowing that Jonah has made a bad choice. He is relying on something other than God. He's trying to create this false sense of hope and security. He's entrusted himself to a vessel of idolatry. Well, this continues. This idea is reinforced in our text today, and there's just a really interesting phrase I want us to notice in verse 5. It says that Jonah goes down below the deck of the ship, but in Hebrew it's this really weird sentence where it says literally that Jonah went down into the far reaches of the ship. And Hebrew scholars just acknowledge that this is awkward grammar, and even the word for ship is different here. It's not the the usual word you would expect. And uh, if you know Hebrew well, what you'll pick up on is this uh, is a word play that sounds almost identical to the phrase, the far reaches of Mount Zion. And it's a phrase that thro- shows up throughout Scripture in, in Psalm 48, for example. Uh, we celebrate the holy mountain of God, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of the earth, the far reaches of Mount Zion. That phrase is identical to the far reaches of the ship except for one letter, right? And so a lot of Hebrew sk- scholars say that there's just deep literary richness. Those who are immersed in Hebrew and in this biblical narrative would be picking up on this. This is what uh, Rosemary Nixon points out in our commentary. In using the phrase, the narrator is tickling the ears of his listeners with sounds which remind them that Jonah's only secure refuge is in God. There's kind of some foreshadowing. Jonah has chosen to entrust himself into a ship from Tarshish instead of fixing himself on the true foundation of God's provision at Mount Zion. Now, here's something even cooler. I'm, gonna, I'm just kind of nerding out on biblical stuff here for a moment. But when you actually keep reading Psalm 48, there is another allusion to our scene. The psalmist is uh, comparing the foundation of those who entrust themselves to the far reaches of Mount Zion. Five verses later, it talks about how, by contrast, God will bring down ships of Tarshish with an east wind. I mentioned last week that the writer of Jonah is doing all these like hyperlinks. It's connecting us to the bigger story. Here's the point, besides it being just really cool. (laughs) The point is that the writer is is asking us to focus on this question, what are we entrusting our life to? Are we entrusting our life to the, the ships of Tarshish that are weak and cannot withstand the storms of life? Or should we instead entrust our lives, fix our lives to the true foundation of God? The point in this story is that Jonah has put his trust in the far reaches of a boat sailing for Tarshish rather than God, and he is about to discover the consequences of this choice. His decision leads him into a storm. But this is the good news that I want to speak into today. This is what I want us to notice in this text. As the story unfolds, we discover that God is at work in the storm. God is at work in the storm, that this isn't the end of the story. In fact, our text even says that God initiates the storm, and this uh, needs to be, we need to be careful here. It's not because God is this vengeful deity who's trying to enact revenge on Jonah. There's actually a severe mercy at work in this text. God is using the storm to actually get Jonah's attention and turn him back on the right track. I want us to notice in this story how God works together these adverse conditions in redemptive ways, and as we do so, I want to be on the lookout in our own life for the way God might be present in some of the storms we are navigating and the adverse conditions that we are walking through, because I recognize, friends, that this isn't just a theoretical conversation, that many of us come today and we are navigating some adverse conditions. Maybe you come today and you're in a relational storm or a vocational storm or a personal storm where you're overwhelmed and things are difficult and disorienting and deconstructing. And I want to notice the way that God can meet us in those places and actually redeem them and, as the Apostle Paul says, work them together for good as we continue reading the story, that 
first thing that we notice about where God is at in the storm is that God can use storms to wake us up, to wake us up. You know, the story, uh, story begins with Jonah asleep in the far reaches of the boat. And there's a, a sense here that uh, Jonah is trying to escape reality. He's continuing in this trajectory of avoiding the cries of those outside the religious establishment, avoiding the cries of his neighbors. He is aloof. He is sleeping. He is escaping the storm. And yet the storm is so strong that it causes these sailors to come down and wake him up. <laughs> and wake him up. And I just wonder if there's something powerful in this image for us as Christ followers. You know, as Christ followers, we are called to be sent out into this world. We live in this tension of being in the world but not of the world. And sometimes I wonder if that balance gets a little bit off. And in our concern uh, of being overly influenced by the world, we just isolate ourselves and we huddle away from the world and we're kind of aloof to the, the needs of those outside the walls of the church. I wonder if sometimes we are asleep when the world around us is scrambling for survival. Again, Rosemary Nixon in her great commentary says, being fast asleep to all but our own self-interest, we church people can sometimes be blind and deaf to the cries of many whose lives are no more than a grim struggle for survival. So I wonder, friends, if sometimes our homes function like ships sailing for Tarshish. Do we cocoon ourselves off with our relative influence and insulate ourselves from the cries of a hurting world. I wonder if at times we prefer to avoid the complexity and pain of the world for a nicely curated view of reality on Pinterest and Instagram. I wonder if at times our churches are at risk of functioning like ships from Tarshish. Do our ships sometimes function more like a cruise ship that is entertaining and, and enjoyable, but isolating from our call to mission? Should we instead be more like a mercy ship where we gather together to be sent out on mission together to a hurting world? Storms have the capacity to wake us up. And if you've ever had a tragedy hit close to home, it does get your attention. And I think there's a call in this text for us to come into proximity. Sometimes stir us awake. I know that uh, I've walked with many people who have had these rock bottom moments where it feels like all is lost and things are going backwards, but in retrospect, those actually were turning point moments where they kind of jolted and stirred people awake from the fact that things aren't going in the right way, that the ships we have entrusted our life to are breaking down under the pressure and we need to find an other God to fix our hope upon. We need to trade the ships from Tarshish for the far reaches of Mount Zion. Storms, friends, can be a moment that wake us up. But storms can also be an opportunity that can help us grow up. As the text continues, we see that Jonah is someone who has a lot of growth ahead of him spiritually. This book ultimately functions like a piece of satire. With great irony, everybody but Jonah is responsive to God. The sailors are responsive to God. Later, the Ninevites turn to God, even after just hearing a five-word, poorly constructed sermon that Jonah begrudgingly gives. The cows of Nineveh bow in repentance, right? This is trying to get our attention. This is satire. That everyone except the one who's appointed as the prophet is waking up to God, is growing, is repenting. I think that's the purpose of this book. 
that we, friends, are never done growing spiritually, even those of us who hold the title of prophet or pastor or leader. Growth and repentance is not just for those outside the walls of the church, but it's for our own hearts, for our own formation as people. And so the book of Jonah ultimately is a mirror that is calling us to humble ourselves and realize that there's more ahead for us, that we have growth ahead. The sailors in this story are more attuned to Yahweh than Jonah at first. They quote this psalm that every pur- everything you purpose, you do. This shows up a couple of times in the Psalms, and they begin to worship and offer sacrifices and vow themselves to the Lord. They're acting like model Israelites in this text, whereas Jonah's relationship to God is more ambiguous. Now, we've seen some turning in this text. He calls upon God, and he says, I'm a Hebrew who worships the God of land and sea, and yet I think the author of this book is still keeping us guessing about his motives. Jonah still has more descent ahead of them, as we're going to see next week. He hasn't hit rock bottom, and his actions are not fully aligning with what he professes to be true. And so Jonah is invited into this season of growth. And the storm causes him to face some foundational questions about who he is and what he really trusts in. The good news of this text is that rather than simply abandoning Jonah, God continues to pursue him. And what we notice is that through the sailors, he has posed all kinds of questions that force him to wrestle with his identity and his beliefs. The the sailors ask him eight different questions. Who are you? What have you done? (laughs) What do you put your trust in? And the storm it provides the equation for him to reevaluate who he is and what he trusts in. I mentioned briefly a couple of weeks ago, or last week, that uh, my first year of college was a really disorienting time, a deconstructing time, and all these core questions were being thrown at me about who I am and what I believe in. And aside from just all the disorienting questions from first-year philosophy and higher criticism of the Bible that I'd never wrestled with, I was also navigating a personal emotional storm. A month before I started college, while I was uh, working at a camp, a child fell to her death and drowned 30 feet in front of me. She was with another leader, and it was just this freak accident outside of our control. Uh, But it caused me for the first time to come very close to suffering and trauma. And I was diagnosed with PTSD that year. I had to work with a counselor just trying to make sense of a world where things like this happen. It was this volatile season. And so that was layered on with all these questions that were just getting at the core of, like, my foundational beliefs. And it was a time where I was just drowning. I was overwhelmed emotionally, spiritually. It was a time where it was just being peppered with questions, just like Jonah is in this text. Who are you? Who is God? What do you really trust in? Can we trust God? Now, I can say this honestly, that as I look back, and only sometimes we can see this in retrospect, I see that that was now one of the most formative seasons in my life. It was one of those seasons uh, where I had to cultivate empathy and a deeper, more resilient faith that could withstand the realities of a broken world. And I just want to hold on on to that hope for those of you who are navigating a season right now that might feel disorienting and overwhelming, that maybe God is going to do some of his greatest redemptive work in your life in this season. Now, again, God doesn't cause all these storms. Not every difficulty is the result of choice. But we do live in a world that is messy. And we do have a God who has not not promised that we won't ever face storms, but he has promised that we will never face storms without the hope of redemption. Without the hope of redemption. So I just encourage us to be on the lookout for the way God might be weaving together seasons of storm, seasons of disorientation for his deeper good. This experience of Jonah invites him to grow spiritually. It forces him to wrestle with and reckon with the deep questions he has been avoiding. Well, the storms of life can cause us to wake up. They can get our attention. 
They provide a context where we are forced to grow up and be formed deeper. And I would also submit to you that as the story continues, that this provides an opportunity for those in this scene to also now look up, to look beyond their own strength and their own human resources to a sovereign and gracious God. This storm causes the sailors to see the futility of their own strength, to look beyond their own resources. And so as interesting as the story continues, they hurl now the precious cargo from Tarshish into the sea, and it does not save them. Their idols are worthless in this storm. And concerned about throwing Jonah over, they say, well, let's try and strain with all our might to row to shore, but their strength cannot save them. Instead, they are forced to put their faith in a God that is bigger than them. And as Jim Bruckner writes in his commentary, the sailors provide us an excellent example by their readiness to acknowledge their helplessness and hear Jonah's witness act on it, and worship the true God. And then notice this, they surrender, believing a seemingly impossible word from Yahweh that Yahweh's appointed man will die for their salvation. They believe and worship Yahweh. Friends, we too are immersed in this cultural narrative that tells us we should be able to save ourselves. And so we strain and we accumulate and we put our trust in these futile ships sailing for Tarshish. We live in a culture that emphasizes individualism, competition, the worship of celebrity and hero. But the Christian story is different. It is a different story. It is a story that reminds us that we are saved by grace and not by work so that no one can boast. We, like these sailors, are called to put our hope in an appointed one, but this appointed one will be named one greater than Jonah, who will also die and be submerged for three days and rise again. And it is as we put our faith in the grace, the forgiveness, and the salvation of God that we experience the power to be rescued from sin and experience the hope of forgiveness. We, too, are called to trust and an appointed one who died for our salvation. And you see, storms can break that illusion of our security and self-sufficiency, the false illusion that we can save ourselves. Storms have the capacity to humble ourselves enough to realize that we need something beyond ourselves. And maybe, again, you come today and you're straining and you're trying to save yourself and you realize that you've come to the end of your resources. And the gospel I want to proclaim to you today is that there is a God who wants to meet you in that place and offer you grace and offer you strength to save you. May we call upon this great God today and put our trust in him. May we sacrifice the futile ship sailing for Tarshish and fix our lives on the foundation of God's great strength and mercy. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this word, and we pray and trust that your spirit would work through the reading of your word today. Lord, we acknowledge the places where we are straining and struggling, where we are facing adverse conditions. And God, I pray that you would meet those of us for whom this is not a theoretical conversation, but for those of us who are struggling, and would your mercy and your grace fill us afresh today as we turn our hearts to you, Lord, we call upon you as our true God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.